Why Did You Marry Him? Pierce Morgan versus Hugh Hefner's widow, Crystal Hefner. Let's check it out. Marrying him when she was 26 and he was 86. Did you see any good in him? He was a complete narcissist. Your book is gonna go quite a long way to destroying his legacy. He's been using and abusing women since day one. Did you know that part of the deal was you had to have sex with this guy? I didn't know at first. So when you came over as someone quite giddy with excitement about marrying Hugh Hefner, was that all a facade? He's buried next to Marilyn Monroe. She didn't have a say who was buried next to her for all eternity. She also didn't have a say when he bought her calendar photos and put her in the first issue of Playboy. And that's what created the brand. You've kept the Hefner name. Why? Does the name Hefner now disgust you? And I don't, did Playboy help the world or did it hurt the world? <laughs> so, did I got, wait a minute, I got a lot of questions. First of all, we, I, I'm not gonna knock her for her feelings or how she feel or what she went through. I wasn't there, you wasn't there. Let's get that out of the way first, all right? And let's remove her. Isn't it interesting that when the person dies, then all the negative comes out? Why does it come out while he was alive? say this stuff was bad about him, you know what I mean? Because it's not like both sides didn't benefit from it. And to say that you didn't know you would have to do certain things, the brand is, play Let let's get into it, let's get into it. They live happily ever after. Here they are on my old CNN show in America, exclusively announcing the date of that big day. <laughs> You've got a scoop for me, haven't you? You're gonna reveal the, the date of the wedding. The date of the wedding. Can I tell him? Sure. It is June 18th. June the 18th. This year, Saturday. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll be there. We're Obviously, excited. it'll be a huge CNN breaking news event. Of course, you're invited. <laughs> According to her explosive new tell-all book, Far From It, and Crystal joins me in the studio. No, Crystal, it's mm. nice to see you again. Nice to see you again. It's, it's been, been a long time. 13 years. Yeah. Um, and in fact, it was a weird series of events because we did that interview. Yeah. Then you, you broke up. And then Hugh came on my show again on his own. And yeah. then you ended up getting married. Yeah, I, I watched the clips back. Uh, I watched Hef come back on your show. And I, I thought that was weird too. I'm like, you just got broken up with and you went straight to media. That's very strange. Well, I've got a clip of him when he came on on his own <laughs> after you briefly broken up and broken off the marriage. Let's, let's take a look. I think the real problems began a couple of months before the, the uh, wedding was set. Uh, <clears throat> when we were talking about, uh, when the lawyers got into it, we were talking about the prenup and et cetera. And uh, we went to London about five or six uh, 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 months before, weeks before, and um, things did not seem quite the way they ought to be. Uh, she was preparing to do uh, uh, a song for the first time, and I think her focus was on that. But uh, in the weeks immediately afterward, as we got very close to the marriage, you know, something was not right, but I didn't see it coming. I mean, I mean, I truly didn't see it coming. How do we not look at, like, the the age difference and not say, okay, like, what's going on here? Is this an arrangement? Is somebody standing to hope to gain something, benefit from this? You know what I mean? What's going on behind the scenes we aren't seeing? Like, what? It just, the dynamic just doesn't make sense. It doesn't align. And I'm talking about for me. Maybe it aligns for you and you see nothing wrong with it. And that's cool. But for me, I'm just looking at them and I'm like, okay, young, vibrant woman, older, playboy general, Hugh Hefner. Make it make sense. Like I said, you patched things up, you did get married, and you were still married when uh, he sadly died. And I say sadly because reading your book, it's a pretty damning indictment of Hugh Hefner, I have to be honest. Very different to the kind of thing that you were saying at the time when you were with him, with me, though, all those years ago. Mm -hmm. What prompted you to write the book? I think, you know, after I left the mansion, I went into therapy and realized that, you know, that place messed me up more than I thought it did. And wow. It was time to talk about it. I realized Hef controlled the narrative for so long, 70 years. And I think more truth needs to come out of the mansion. And watching those clips back was just very interesting. What does it make you feel? The clip about when I left, uh, it cut off right before it said uh, she didn't even tell her best friend, Anna. And, 
yeah, I, she was another one I was sleeping with at the time. So mm -hmm. it just all seems so phony and fake. And he's trying to get people to feel sorry for him. And you were, you were just 21 when you went into the mansion. Wow. Hugh Hefner was an iconic figure. People knew the Playboy Mansion was probably a place where a lot of sex happened, never mind anything else. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we'd all seen Playboy magazine and so on. Um, were you shocked by what actually happened in there? Did you have in your head a sort of slightly more, I don't know, cleaner view of what the Playboy Mansion was about? Because I certainly wouldn't have done. Yeah, well, growing up, I would see Playboy magazines. I would see these women and think, wow, they're powerful. They have the world at their feet. And I would idolize them. And the celebrities at the time were Jenny McCarthy, Pamela Anderson, Carmen Electra. And you just kind of want to be like them and emulate them. And Playboy, to me, was a place of freedom and you know, freedom of expression. And it was anything but that. I felt completely trapped. So Playboy was pretty much the social media back then. That's what we should call it, right? Because nowadays you, you turn, you, you, you click the app and you pull up social media and you see these stars and these celebrities and you think they're having the just the most glamorous lifestyle. You know what I mean? You see them, you think they're just living it up. Life couldn't be better for them. And that's the problem. There lies the problem. You don't see what's going on behind the scenes. You don't see what's really happening. They're only showing you the good. And you, we fall in love with the idea and the image, not knowing what all comes with that. And I think that's the problem. And we have to take self accountability for that. We do. We have to take, because we don't, we just see that and we take it and run with it and say, we want to do that. You know what I mean? Like I, I can imagine the stories that would come out of the Playboy Mansion and from the girls that went through their times. I'm not naive to think they're all good. When you got there, I mean, you say in the book uh, that Hugh Hefner knew he could draw in vulnerable women like a magnet and have them do whatever he wanted in exchange for even the possibility of a payoff, status, some money, a modeling job. I would probably add great parties. I went to one of them, the Midsummer Night's Dream Party. I think it was in 2007. And I took my fiance and it was a crazy event. I mean, it was like being at one of Caligula's orgies. There were <laughs> hundreds of people walking around who I thought were wearing underwear and it was paint. They were all naked. Um, it, the opulence, the champagne, the lobster, the caviar, the thing, and then the grotto. Um, all of it on the face of it, it was kind of party central, felt quite glamorous, didn't feel massively sleazy. And yet your book and other books by a number of the playmates paint a picture of a really dark, sleazy underbelly that was going on really mm. around Hugh Hefner. Yeah. yeah, the parties were beautiful. They put a lot of money into the parties. You know, people were obsessed. Big stars would all go, I mean, it all go. Yeah, people were obsessed and they loved the grotto, but the grotto ended up having like Legionnaire's disease and really? <laughs> people caught le Legionnaire's from the grotto. Because it was grotty. It was disgusting. The yeah. house was disgusting. It was full of mold. I got very sick. Um, it was like really? a time capsule from the 70s that never Got referred. When you when you went in as a playmate, did you know that part of the deal was you had to have sex with this guy? I didn't know at first what was going to happen, especially that first night because I had just met him. Usually, you don't do that on the first night, but Hef does, and yeah. Where did you actually meet? Oh, at a party, Halloween party, two thousand eight. And so he says, oh, "This is deeper than I thought." Like. Man, every I can't wait till the stuff comes out about this, bro. Because, like I said, outside looking in, we all, I ain't going to say we all, I'll speak for myself. I thought that was just the most player lifestyle ever. Beautiful women, you having your pick. You know what I mean? If you, you dump one, here's another one coming for you. You got all this money you making from these movies, like... I just thought it was the lifestyle, just like she said. Come come into the residence. Yeah, I, I had to submit a photo to go and get approved. I think it's different for, you know, a young woman that's not famous rather than a, mm. you know, famous man or woman. Um, so I had to be approved. I drive up to a parking garage. And what are you thinking? Are you thinking, I mean, I think you said in the book, you felt like, you know, you were 
a Willy Wonka golden ticket winner. This was the door to paradise. Yeah, I mean, I grew up with no money. I was apartment to apartment. You know, I walk in and I see like carved wood and all these mm -hmm. beautiful ornate things. And it was beautiful. And every, this is, I thought, oh, this is how the other half live and celebrities and Hugh Hefner and the media idolized him at that time. The world idolized him. His staff idolized him. It was I mean, the stars who went to the Playboy Mansion, Jack Nicholson, Warren Beatty, Elvis Presley, Leo DiCaprio, they all used to go down there. It was seen as not somewhere that had a stigma to it. It was like fun, it was glamorous, it was sexy, it was the hot place to be seen. I think that celebrities wanted to check it out, mm -hmm. but the celebrities that were there so often all the time, mm -hmm. they were more of like the sleazy pervert kind. Right. There mm -hmm. were a lot of them. Were they? Yeah, it's bad. When Ooh. you realize you've got to go- I bet she got some names and some stories and different things. I, hey, I, I don't normally get people booked, but I might want to read hers. I sleep with Hugh Hefner. Do you feel shocked, appalled, a bit surprised? I mean, what's your genuine emotion in that moment? I thought, you know, I guess this is what happens here, so. Because you were, what, 21 and he's, what, 80, 81. 80, 81? We were 60 years apart. Right. Oh, yeah, almost. So did you feel repulsed at having to do it or, or excited? I mean, what was your what? honest emotion when you first started doing it? 80. I think I was pulled in. It was you know, magnetic, and if that's what he wanted, and there were other girls there, I'm like, okay, like, I guess I'm just gonna be part of this and see what happens. How many girls would there be? That first night, there were three other girls, twins. And you'd all have to have sex with them. Yeah, so. The twins were only 19 at the time, and they're doing terribly now, so. Really? It's hard. What? How many of the playmates do you think were damaged by this, and how many actually found it fine because they kind of accepted that was the transactional deal for everything else that came with being a playmate. I think some would sleep with them and become playmates and they just go about their lives. And then other people like us, girlfriends who live there, you, you're more controlled, so it's harder. Why marry him? I mean, you go through years of this right. ordeal, mm -hmm. which you paint in graphic detail in the book. It sounds horrendous. Mm -hmm. you know, you're 60 years younger than this guy. You've got to keep having sex with group sex with a, a guy in his 80s right. whilst watching porn and everything else. Why would you want to marry someone like that? Right. I was at the mansion and he gave me a ring. He didn't really ask me to marry him. He just handed me a ring and I just thought, okay, if I don't marry him, then I'm leaving tomorrow. Maybe he wants a good PR story before he dies. And so I just, I went along with it. And I didn't have the tools then that I have now. Do y'all think she's being honest right here? Because that was a great question by Pierce. Why would you marry somebody you almost sort of like saying you, you're repulsed from? Like, you, you, it's just ilk. It's 60 years apart and everything that's going on and all of this. But you still stay. I, that's, my, that's my question. Like, did you, was there something for you to gain if you stayed? Is there something you wanted and you felt like this was the only way to get it? Why stay in somewhere? You know what I mean? Unless somebody's holding you against their will. Uh, if they're holding you against your will and you can't leave, we get that. We understand that and we sympathize and empathize with that. But if that's not the case, then we have to question your motives as well. What was it? Absolutely. I mean, when I interviewed you, I'll be honest with you, when I interviewed you, um, you've been there a few years and you've been like four or five years by then. You didn't come over as somebody being traumatized. I mean, you came over as someone quite giddy with excitement about marrying Hugh Hefner and enjoying the life. Was that all a facade? I was nervous. Were you faking it to me? Or? Yes. I, I there you have quickly it. went in my mind and was like, okay, what's my rehearsed answer? What did Hef tell me to say when someone asked mm -hmm. me this? And at that time, the media attacked me. I was a low-hanging fruit. People would just, what's it like being with an old man? What do old, old balls look like? And are you a gold digger? And people would just attack me all the time. So I would just put on this fake, happy face and like, what did Hef tell me to say? And then when you ask, so what, mm. what do you have in common with an 80 something year old, I'm like, oh, uh, what, what did he tell me to say? So I just spit, would spit that out and 
It was traumatizing. I, my soul like left my body and- Did you have no family, like, friends saying, get out of here? Right. Not really. Mm. What was keeping you there? I mean, you could have left. You could have just right. gone, couldn't you? Yeah, and toward the end, I had saved millions of dollars. Most of that I made on my own. So he, he gave you millions of dollars? No, or? he didn't. We bought a mutual house and because he had sold the company and if he died, he wanted me to have somewhere to go. And if something happened with the company, he wanted somewhere to go. So we did have a house that I ended up with, but most of it I made, I made on my own. I was buying houses in secret while I was there because he controlled me financially. I re But where did the money come from for you to be able to buy the houses? That would have been my next question. Or where did the money come from? Did you obtain that money through, I don't know, through gigs from Hef or associated with Playboy or affiliated with Playboy or because your name, because of Playboy was was up in lights now and people know you, did you get gigs because of that? Because that would play in the mind. That, that would kind of like make you think, okay, I need to stay. Or if I leave, then all of this may go away. So that could have been psychologically messing with you as well. You know what I'm saying? Physically, financially, emotionally, everything. Mm -hmm. When we were, um, you were talking to Hef and you said, oh, did Crystal leave as much money or whatever? Mm -hmm. And he would give me enough, but not ever enough to leave. Like what? A thousand dollars every Friday that I had to beg for and he would count it out. 100, 200, mm -hmm. 300. So the whole thing really was transactional with all the playmates. A hundred percent. And he, people ask like, did you really love Hef or did he really love you? And what do you think? I thought, oh, this man can't really love me if he wants multiple people in the bedroom all the time. All he talks about is himself. All he wants you to talk about is himself. I was just his mirror. Reflecting. You said in the book, yeah. it only say good things was his thing. He just wanted everything to be utopia, right? This was utopia. He was living every man's dream. He was going to bed with all these hot playmates who were 60 years younger than him. It was all in a mansion, there were glamorous parties, celebrities. So that was the picture he wanted to paint. That was the, the myth, if you like, of the Playboy Mansion. Is I mean, that every to... man's dream? Well, no, I mean, I'd say that's in his head. That's how he saw this world that he created. It was the escapist dream. I, a... I think he was a sad little boy that you know, he was he was dorky. Every girl he had a crush on went with somebody else, and mm. his first wife cheated on him. And I think he overcompensated for that. And um, did you did you see any good in him when you look back on it? Was there any good in him? He was a complete narcissist. And I don't did Playboy help the world or did it hurt the world? What do you think? I think it hurt it. Why? I think it paved the way for you know toxic beauty standards and. A bunch of horrible things. <laughs> There's a clip from the 60s um, when he said this about Playboy. The major things that, uh, that really prompt sexual behavior or, uh, are the inner drives in a human being. What a society does in its various forms of mass communication, uh, magazines, movies, advertising, whatever it may be, is to give some specific direction to this sex drive. Certainly you no, don't believe well, that sex should be expressed <clears throat> without any uh, restraint at all. Well, let's take a let's take a uh, for a moment uh, consideration of exactly what kind of sex Playboy emphasizes. Primarily heterosexual, healthy, uh, associating sex with beauty, uh, uh, with humor, things that are apt to take the onus and the sickness away from sex. It is attempting continually to keep it in the dark, uh, to uh, associate it continually with uh, things either sacred or profane. I mean, he paints, again, a sort of intellectual picture there of why he's a force for good and emancipation, if you like, of women and feminism, and this is all great and wholesome and positive and beautiful. But at the same time, he's, beauty is subjective and all he was choosing is women that he personally was attracted to to be in the magazine. Like, how is that free? Is you call him in the book a small man under the big myth. It's quite a damning line. Yeah, uh, before he passed away, I, he stopped speaking and I, if he was still conscious, I wanted him to watch some, I put Wizard of Oz, it was very colorful mm. and I thought he would like it. And thinking back to that, Mike, he was, he was the wizard all along. He was the man behind the curtain. Was he an evil man? 
I don't think the he realized the damage that he did while he was doing it. I think he was a narcissist for sure, and I I, I don't think he understood that term. He just knew who he was. And did you ever confront him about his behavior? I didn't. I didn't. And so I, all of this <laughs> you've written would be news to him. He'd be shocked. I would hope he learned some lesson toward the end of his life. T toward the end of his life, I, you know, I removed my implants, I stopped bleaching my hair, and I'm just like, accept me for who I am. And he, maybe he started respecting me a little bit. I'm not sure. But if nobody ever tell, told him or said anything to him, then he thought what he was doing was right. He probably thought he was doing no wrong. Because, you know, people have a habit of convincing themselves in their mind what they, they can justify anything. And if they can justify it and then you treat them as such, then why, what would make you think I would realize, you know what I mean? What I'm doing is wrong if I can justify it. So he needed people to tell him to straighten out, but he wasn't gonna get that because the women at the time, not speaking about her, just probably in general, the women probably looked at him as a meal ticket or opportunity. And the fellas probably looked at him as, Bro, you living a life. As as Pierce said, every man's dream. So when everybody's placing him on a pedestal, then of course he probably thought he did nothing wrong. Do you get emotional when you think about it? I get emotional when I read the last page of my book. I can't can't read it without crying. And the last page talks about the little girls that would write to him saying, I just got a Playboy bedspread. I'm 11 years old. <laughs> what does it take to be part of the mansion? I want to come and live there. And what does that take? And it's really upsetting to me mm. because it was a lot of girls' dream. And That's what the last chapter of the book's about. Yeah. And every time you read that, it's painful to you. Absolutely. Because you think if only you knew, it wouldn't be a dream, it would be a nightmare. Absolutely. This is the book I wish I had when I was 21 years old. And I've had a lot of women, an outpouring of women writing to me and saying, thank you, that was my dream. And I'm glad I'm just in my regular house in Illinois and, and, and thank you so much. So. How did you feel when, when he died? First, I felt guilty, wondering if there's something I could have done to, to help him more. Um, but after a while, I realized he did a lot of damage. And Me Too happened a month after he passed away. Right. And what would have happened to him if he'd been alive when that campaign started? I think he would have been doing the same stuff, just quieter about it. Well, would he have been stuff? held to account as people like Harvey Weinstein were and others? Potentially. Do you think what he did constituted non-consensual assault or rape? Or was mm. it consensual but transactional and sleazy? It was the second one. Right. Yeah, it's consensual. Everybody there was doing it consensually, but they felt bad about it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I remember girls coming up to the bedroom and them, him trying to, like, sleep with them and they didn't really want to. And he would say, oh, no one likes a prude. Like, get out, get out of my room. So. There will be people watching going, come off it, Crystal. You, you knew what you were doing. You, and how long were you there for at the mansion in the end? Uh, almost a decade. Right. Let's say 10 years living the life of Hugh Hefner's playmate and then his wife and so on with the money and the glamour and the parties they say to write all this after he dies is a bit much why didn't you say any of this when he was still alive or say it to his face yeah. people will think that yeah uh, not I, all some <laughs> just some and that's fine yeah i stay quiet. you understand why some people would be yeah i get it what no. do you say to them i stayed quiet for five years i was in therapy for five years me too validated a lot of my experiences and you know, we have terms that we didn't have them, you know, about misogyny, narcissism, and boundaries. Mm. I didn't even know what boundaries were until just a few years ago. And so I didn't have the tools then that I have now. And whether he was still alive or not, this book would still be out. And it's helping a lot of people and relationships that are financial abusive, emotionally abusive. And Have you been able to have a, a meaningful relationship since? I had two horrible relationships, repeating the same patterns, mm. um, manipulative, controlling relationships. And this time I was paying the bills. It was awful. But now I'm in a happy, healthy relationship and I finally feel free. And what kind of guy is your man? A man that I feel very safe with, a man that's kind, caring, and treats me with lots of respect.
and as an equal. You actually grew up in the UK, in West Bromwich in the Midlands until you were about eight years old. So you're actually, you're British, right? I mean, yeah, I'm British. Uh, I had an accent when I was young. My mom still has a very thick accent. My dad did too, but he mm. passed away. And you have loads of relatives here? Yeah, my mom's one of eight and my family lives here. So I love coming here because I get to see my family. And what does your mom make of it all, what you've been through? <sighs> she she loved calling Hugh Hefner her son-in-law when really he, he could have been her granddad. But now, right. she, <laughs> yeah. Because she must. That's another dynamic of it. Imagine being pressured. You know what I mean? Because people may think, oh man, the family probably tried to tell her, warn her, get out of there, get out of there, leave him, get away from that. You know what I'm saying? Preserve your sanity. You're young. Don't do this to yourself. But that's not always the case. A lot of times, the family, your family, because they see that you could become successful, famous, rich, and everything, and they think they stand to benefit from it, so they'll push you further into it. <laughs> like, family? Sometimes you hate family, bro, because they, makes it, it, they make it worse, right? So to hear that, hear him, that that's, in, that's crazy to hear, to hear, man, because you never really know, and that can play a part on your mental health as well. Be younger than him yeah, by some yeah, distance. She's, yeah, yeah, she's around uh, 70 now, mm. so. I mean, he, he was born in 1926, so. Um, but now she, she... When she read the book, how did she react? She said she didn't realize how toxic it was there, and she's sorry. Sorry for what? Letting me go up there in the first place. Mm. Because, again, people will say, well, what, why would a mother let her daughter do that? Yeah, and I asked her about it, and she said, you know, you were 21, you were an adult, you were going to make your own decision anyway. True. How old are you now, True. if you don't mind me asking? I'm 37. You kept the Hefner name. I'm curious, why? I'm changing it. You are? Yeah. What, legally going to change it? Mm -hmm. What are you going to change it to? Crystal Harris. Which is your yeah. maiden name. Original name, and mm. not changing it from there ever again. And it, does the name Hefner now disgust you? Yeah, I never liked it. <laughs> when we first got married, the whole office changed it, and I had no idea how to do it. And people think I'm, yeah, just trying to keep it, but I'm not. It's, it's leaving. When he died, a lot of people could be me. Somebody gonna say it's convenient that you're changing it now after the book came out. Like, some people are gonna be like, well, why didn't you change it before the book came out? And then got that, or, or you know what I mean? Got the sales and the attention and everything else off of your name instead of the last name Hefner. People gonna ask those questions. I think from memory, um, tweeted nice things about him. Uh, Kim Kardashian said, RIP to the legendary Hugh Hefner. I'm so honored to have been a part of the Playboy team. You'll be greatly missed. Love you, Hef. Kiss, kiss, kiss. What, what do you think about people like Kim that tweeted things like that? Well, I think he helped launch Kim's career. She did a shoot for Playboy on her reality show and she had freedom. I think it's different for me, someone who was there day to day and trapped. The Playboy machine's pretty well done now. I mean, it's kind of yeah. disintegrated. I hope so. Yeah, I was going to ask you, I mean, is that a, is that a good thing? Yeah, I, I think Playboy's actually doing better. There, you know, there, there was a man on the cover recently and oh, maybe it's actually about freedom and expression across everybody, you know, all cultures, everything. But before it, it, it wasn't what have said it was. So hopefully now, you know, it's actually so it's not doing as bad as some people think it is? I'm not sure. I'm not affiliated with Playboy mm. and when anybody asks me. They, they you, mean, you mean better morally, perhaps, rather than <laughs> yeah. financially? Because it was a, a huge money spinning enterprise. Yeah, but I, I think uh, as Hef got older, it, it kind of it died down. How do you remember him now? When you finished the book and you thought, I spent all these years with this guy. What's your most vivid memory of him? I think... I don't know if, if he if he was alive now and I wrote this book, I think I would just throw it at him and walk away. I'm over it. Would you have liked to have had that moment? Yes. A reality check for him. Yeah. To say this is how you made me actually feel. Yes, he. Would he be? Would he have been surprised? Do you think that he lived in a? He said he's a narcissist. Was he so deluded? He didn't really know that this was what the playmates were thinking. Did he think you were all having a great time? Yeah, he must have thought that. And he manic uh, meticulously kept 3,000 scrapbooks and he would work on it every every day, every day, because he thought he was somebody who would be studied for generations and generations about 
how iconic he is and what he's done for human history mm. in a positive way. Your book is going to go quite a long way to destroying his legacy. Do you feel comfortable about that as, as his wife? Good question. I feel comfortable that my book is resonating with so many women and so much so that it's become an instant bestseller in New York Times. So I'm very proud of it. And this is my truth and I have nothing to hide. And yeah, I'm, I'm very proud. He's buried next to Marilyn Monroe. I actually know that very spot where he is. Been down to that. It, it's a fascinating, it's full of very famous, iconic people, that graveyard. Yeah. Um, have you been there? Have you been to his gravesite? I haven't been back since he was buried there. Mm. And I remember him reminding me constantly, you know where I want to be buried. I don't care about anything else. I won't be here, but make sure that's where I'm buried. She didn't have a say who was buried next to her for all eternity. She also didn't have a say when he bought her calendar photos and put her in the first issue of Playboy. She got paid nothing. And that's what created the brand. So he, he's been using and abusing women since day one. Mm. Using and abusing Marilyn by the sound of it. Absolutely. Even after death. I feel sorry for her. Having to reside forever next to him. Yes. Would you have any desire to be buried near him? I'm going to be buried far away. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Have you found happiness now? I mean, you say you're happy in a relationship, but you yourself, are you happy again now? Do you feel liberated when you finish the book? Yeah, I did. And I remember shortly after the mansion, someone asked me like, oh, what do you like? And I didn't know. And I, I know You've been told what to like. Someone, yeah, someone asked me, well, what do you like? And I just, I, I didn't know. And mm. I'm like, it's, it seems so small, but I'm like, what do I like? So I, She I, was under a spell, bro. Like when you, when somebody asks you the question of what do you like and you can't even answer it, you just don't know. Like you were being either controlled, manipulated, and you were under a heavy spell. I started traveling, started spending more time in nature. I ended up buying a farm in Hawaii. I'm like, oh, I love the nature. I, I love being with my dog. And it's taken me a while to just find myself again. Mm -hmm. And I lost myself in that place and to half. And I'm, I'm glad I'm, I'm back to me. You know, it's funny, as we're talking about him, I, I remember that party I went to. I remember he was in the smoking jacket and he was sitting on a throne and he was surrounded. You may well have been one of them. I'm sure you were um, surrounded by playmates, surrounded by people who were naked and painted and so on. He had lobster and caviar and champagne. And it, it was a picture of a man living the dream. And yet when I read your book, it was a kind of sickening nightmare was going on behind mm. the scenes. Actually quite shocking. Yeah, and he was a sad man. He was, you know, some people fill the void with alcohol, mm. <laughs> drugs, gambling, shopping, and he filled it with women and took advantage of women. But that, that hole in his soul was, was never filled. He died a very sad man. Oh. Crystal, thank you. It's great to see you again after Thanks all this time. Too. 13. We never know till we know, I guess.